Summer 2008 was a beautiful day and I was in Italy visiting my family. I was on a train from Pisa to Livorno, my hometown, and I remember myself thinking, wow, this is a beautiful day. So now I'm going back to my, to my family. I can spend some time with them. So I get stepping out of the train. I exit the station. I start to walk on a beautiful parkway when all of a sudden, oh my God, I just lost my phone on the train. So I'm pretty sure you know the feeling. And what I remember about that moment was a terrible feeling it hit me like a punch in the stomach. But at the end of the day, it's just a fun, right? It's expensive, we know that. But if you have the money, you can always buy another one and fix the problem. So why I felt so bad? Why that terrible feeling? Well, like many of us, I use that fun to connect and create relationships with the most important people in my life. And before the cloud era, with no backup whatsoever, I had a terrible feeling that an endless archive of meaningful moment was just gone forever. From a design perspective, the interesting question is, what really happened that day? And more importantly, why this happened? But to give you an answer, I have to bring you with me a few years in the future, on April 9, 2012. On that day, something remarkable happened. Facebook acquired Instagram. What is remarkable about that event is that on the day of the acquisition, the Instagram value, what the NBA guys call the book value, was 85 million. But if you remember how much Facebook paid for that company, they paid 1.1 billion. So why Facebook paid 1.1 billion for a company that had a value of 85 million? Why Facebook paid 12 times more to acquire a small company? Well, the extra billion came from the relationship that Instagram established with the customer base came from how much the people they care about Instagram and the value that they deliver in their life. So if you don't remember anything about this lecture, anything about, about what I was I'm about to say, remember this, you are in the relationship business. Doesn't matter if you are a designer, if you are a business owner, if you run a business for someone else, your priority, as you will see today, should be to create meaningful relationship with people. In the past centuries, we see an evolution on the value generation from the creation of products to the delivery of services to the staging of experiences. But what are the implications in the day-to-day -day life? Well, there are some interesting ones. So first and foremost, the experience is now pervasive and intimate. But why? Pervasive because these devices are always with us. And intimate because the experience is based on an intimate relationship that we establish with the people that are using the product or the service with us. But 10 years ago, that wasn't the case, right? So if you remember, when mobility wasn't a viable option, we used the desktop in the morning, more likely during the night, right? But today, today the landscape is quite changed. So we use the device multiple times during the day, our phones, is one and in the pocket away from every moment in our life. And this change 
has a couple of meaningful implications. The first one, the expectation raised. Because think about it, if you have to use something a couple of times a day, well, you can live with a poor experience, right? Well, it's crap, but I can live with it. But think about using something terrible 2,000 times during the day. So you end up intoxicating your own life, right? The experience has to be usable, has to be pleasurable, has to have some value. Otherwise, it's bad. Another implication is that we start to use that device as a gate to connect and establish relationship with the people that we care, the people that are more important in our life. I was lucky enough to work for some of the best design driven company and today I want to share with you, talking about business strategy, some of the lessons, some of the things that you have learned working with them. The first thing is design is the practice of generating value through problem solving. Make no mistake, if you are a designer, you are a problem solver. Forget about pixel, forget about sketching, forget about everything else. If you don't solve a problem that makes someone else's life better, and at the same time create a sustainable business, you are not a designer. You are something else, and it's fine, but you are not a designer. And other things is that when we want to design the relationship, we have to understand that the relationship triggers in the user mind some cognitive process, some value perception process that we can't control directly. So we call ourselves experienced designer, <clears throat> but it's like someone that designed a truck calling Intel Formula One designer. One thing is designing the truck, Another thing is the Formula One experience. In the very same way, we can't design directly an experience. The only thing we can do is to design a trigger that enable an experience, that enable the cognitive process in the user mind. Why I'm saying that? Because that is like um, a new humility bot. Because you have to remember that you can't design in isolation. You can't design without connecting with people because you'll never be able to understand what happened in their world. And if you don't understand the needs, you don't uncover the needs, you'll never be able to figure out the, the trigger that you have to design to create that experience. And when we start to talk about relationship and value, we have to know that there are five major types of values. There is financial, there is functional, there is emotional, identity, and meaningful. <clears throat> the first two are qualitative type of value. Are the 85 million in the Instagram story? The other two, the qualitative, are the billion in the Instagram story. So now we can start to feel and scratch the surface and understand that if we want to increase the value of our company is better that we start to focus on design, nurture, and grow relationship with the goal of unleash qualitative type of value. The value perception is an unconscious process, but just for the sake of the conversation, we can not say that the functional value answers the question, do this, do this do what I need, and the financial does this have a good cost-benefits ratio for the emotional? Does this make me feel X, Y, or Z for the identity? Does this reflect myself? I like Adidas, as you can see from my shoes. But I have a friend of mine that is in love with Nike. He said, no, 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 I'm a Nike guy. I'm an Apple guy. I'm a Google guy. This is an example when we connect with the identity of a company, it's quite hard to articulate the reason because the part of the brain that controls language is not the part of the brain that controls behavior and emotions. That's the reason. 
but it's, 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 it's intangible, but it's strong and it's real. And the qualitative value is accountable for the most part of the total value of your company, of your family, of your friends group, of your football team, doesn't matter. What is a human interaction? There is a qualitative value. So if you want to increase that type of value, you have to work on that one. And what happened when a value became relevant in someone's life is that that type of value became premium value. And then you are willing to pay more because that value bring something to your life. So if you're like me that you love cars, I think you will agree that driving a Ferrari is a completely different experience compared to driving another car. And that's again, because the they qualitative value is intangible, but extremely real. But at the same time, it's subjective. And that's another challenge for the designer. That's why you have to connect with the user. You can't say, I designed that because I believe, I believe, but you never know what is going on in the other people's mind until you connect with them. So if you don't love car, like myself, you don't really care about driving a Ferrari. Maybe you care about eating health food. So you get premium value for something else. But the great things about premium value is that it's hard to copy. And that's why it's an effective competitive advantage. I'm still, I don't know, why in 2017 the people, they still don't get that point. And what they do, they copy the product. They try to, to copy the service. They can't even try to hire your guys. But they, ne they will never be able to copy the relationship that you establish with your customer from one day to another that give you years of competitive advantage. That's what happened with Apple and Google. It took years before catching up. Another thing is that design is a human-centered mindset. It's not a process. It's not a department. It's even less something that happened once in your company. But since it's a mindset, you can adopt it. And everyone in the company can adopt it. And now we will, we will look at a couple of times, a couple of ways to do it. And design thinking, what we call design thinking, is way more than just thinking. Actually, design thinking comes from David Kelly, one of the founders of the Stanford Design School. They are relabel the human-centered design process that he used in his film IDEO. And he did it because he thought it was a good idea to sell it. And it worked for many years. But now, at that stage of maturity, that starts to create problems. Because the people that say, is that thinking? Well, it's just a fluffiness, right? It's just thinking. You don't get things done. <clears throat> Actually, behind the design thinking, there are three pillars. So you have design thinking, but you, then you have design doing. And then you have the design environment. And the culture that you have in your company, but the culture that you have in your family, that you have in your group, when you go to the pub watching the football match, is a function of the people and the environment. It's a function of what the people think and what the people do inside a given environment that has, we will see today, affect the behavior. So the design thinking is the one that is responsible for the holistic problem-solving approach. They throw a problem of, uh, at you and you say, okay, is this the problem? Is this something that is worth our time? Can we improve people's life? Let me get, get the bigger picture, the holistic view, and then you try to explore the problem domain. And then you have the design doing. The design doing is when you visualize your idea. You give birth to your hypothesis with the goal of asking more questions to the user. And then you have the design environment, last but not least. If you don't get the environment right, design thinking and design doing doesn't happen. 
And now that we dissected the practice of design into its three primitives or dimension, we can start to understand how to scale it across an organization. So you have the environment. The environment has to be present everywhere, not just in the design studio. And by the way, you shouldn't have just one design studio. The design should be flexible. The people, even better, if, if, if everything is on wheels. So the people, they can move around and, and reshape the layout because every project is different. Every project has different requirements. The people, they, are, they have to feel comfortable in rearrange everything to optimize the group thinking and the vertical thinking because they are both crucial. And then you have the design thinking. You have the design team and then all the other teams there is no difference. Apply a design thinking means be human centric. Think about marketing. We don't, we don't bring an example for the design team. Think about marketing. For example, with Sony, we created a video for the new phone which they really, we released at the latest mobile congress. So we create a lot, lots of prototypes. We put together a narrative behind the video and we say, that's the message that we want to spread. Okay, let's create a quick and dirty video, and then we test it with the people. We want to convey that message. What's your feedback? Oh, no, I, I get a completely different feeling. Okay, let's work again on the prototype. So this is an example of design thinking in the marketing space. You don't need to push pixel for that. And then you have the design doing. The design doing is specific to every department, because as you can imagine, if you work in the design team, you may create a mobile app prototype. If you work in the marketing, you have a video prototype, or another one, a plan, a sale plan prototype. Or if you work in the tech team, you, you may create a prototype based on some functions, some functionality, before you invest even more time in that. So now, this is, can be used as a framework to bring inside design in your group. And I say group because it can be everything, organization, company, group of friends, doesn't matter. Problem solver applies to everything. We can just start to talk and rethink about the space. You know, the talk to minds, for example, conversation after the conference. This is still design. You don't need to be digital. You don't, you don't need to be a designer to do it. So now that we introduced that framework, I want to talk about it show you 10 questions that you can use to challenge your environment, to understand more about your environment. The first one, who is the most senior designer in your company? Even better, who is the most senior design advocate in your company? Who is the most senior person that has design as main priority in his life? Because if you have a lead you ask, the only thing that you can affect is the design team. Because that defines the impact of your initiative, or your transformation. If you have a head of a director, you end up affecting the entire department. But if you have a vice president, an officer, you may hope to affect an entire company. Because what you want to avoid is conflicts in priorities, and we will see later. So are you calling design thinking? Because we, I love the word, I, I love the definition, but that starts to create a problem. You can't sell design thinking to other department if you call it design thinking. Because think about the developers. They have their engineering thinking. It actually is quite different for a good reason compared to design thinking. And he said, why well, have to think like a designer? That doesn't help me in my job. Why I have to give a damn about this design thinking? So ask them to be human-centered, not design thinker. Ask them to think about the problem they are solving, the value they are creating with their code, and how they are going to impact the people with their solution. This is design thinking. You don't need to call it that way. Do we have a training for non-designer? I know that that's probably applying more in a big company, but you can't ask someone 
to do something new if you don't train it. It's not fair. It doesn't happen. So you can't just say, oh, you know what? I've got a, a nice PDF. You send an email, here you go. Design thinking, done. So it doesn't work like that. It requires hard effort on both ways. And you have to train people. You have to invest on them. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Do you have a physical space that supports the process? We saw, right? If you don't get the environment right first, forget about it. Forget about it. Because imagine you want to apply the thinking and you don't even have the you don't even have the post-it or the whiteboard. Or you want to move and join a conversation inside inside the team and you don't have a space. It doesn't happen, even if you know what to do and you want to do it. If you don't have the environment. It's never going to happen. Do you have a process and a team structure that engender collaboration and support the design practice? Because, think about it, again, if you don't work on the operation, day-to-day -day operation, and you don't allocate time and resources and effort in connecting with the people outside, uncover the needs, Evaluate the prototype, taking the time to build a prototype, you end up paying double the price because you ship crap that nobody wants. So you have to have a good process. It's nothing to do with design, that it's a mindset, but you need a good process. Do you align all the different team and department? That's one of them. The that's the best one. I love that one. Because doesn't matter how many times you say that, it's never happened in the 9% of the company. What happened, you have the design that is accountable for the quality of the experience, right? That's what we do. That's what, wow, design. And then you have the marketing that is accountable for sales. And then you have the, the developers that are accountable for the points, if they use points, they deliver. Are they delivering on time? So you have three, might one more, Product, other department. You have three separate teams that, in order to get promoted, get a bonus at the end of the year, and get consideration from the manager, they have to do three completely different things. Guess what is going to happen? That what is going to happen that meeting? When I said, nah, I don't think that's good, but the real reason is maybe because he, ha he has to do something else because his boss is asking to deliver on time. So you, why I have to change the design? If the goal is not to ship something good, my goal is to ship on time, otherwise I lose my job. So in a design-driven company, everyone in the company, from the janitor to the CEO, is accountable for the quality of the things that you ship. That's the main priority. The code is good if you deliver quality solution. Otherwise, it's not a bad code. It's just a bad code. Are you rewarding the group or the individual? Because design is a team sport. Again, if you give bonus and promotion for individual like individualist like behavior, that's you're not gonna get the best from your team, right? Oh, I want a team sport. Why in order to get a bonus? You have to do something that goes against the teams. They think it's interesting, right? So it doesn't work. So what happened, what happened is that you have to, again, reward the behavior that you want. Two more. Are you speaking the business language? Because when you are inside the team and you want to promote design outside, you have to step outside. As you step outside, you have to talk different languages. You can't talk the design language with the people from marketing and business. So your goal as a designer is to translate what happened in, your, in the design team to other people so they can appreciate. And that leads me to another point. That is, do you measure design? Because at the beginning of every transformation, your priority should be to create trust outside the team. Because the people are skeptic. What is this fluffy things design? Ah, oh, we don't really need it. We're doing great. So what you have to do is to come up with some KPI. For example, for the design thinking can be the number of ideas that we created, generated against 
a given problem. For the design doing can be the number of prototypes that we created, the number of hypotheses that we, we disproved before deliver something that actually translates in saving money. Look, we thought that was great, but then we disproved and we didn't deliver, and we save money instead of shipping crap. And then you tie those KPI to the company's bottom line. For example, we deliver X, we create the X solution, and then we created Y prototypes. This proved Z hypothesis, and then we deliver something that increased by 12% the revenue. That's how you connect design using business terms. And the last one, are you talking about or demonstrating design? One of the principles is show. Show, don't tell. So if you want to evangelize design, you have to spread the message that your goal is to solve people's problem and grow a sustainable business. That's it. Forget about Pixel. Keep it for you in your circle when you say, oh, the latest sketch version. What does functionality? Nobody give a damn about it. If you want to grow design inside the business, talk and show a tangible benefits. So let me wrap up what I just said. So if we want to grow the business and increase the value, we have to start to design relationships. And if we design, if we want to design relationships, we have to implement a solid human-centered design approach. But to implement a solid human-centered design approach, we have to connect with the people because we have to uncover the needs in order to design and figure out the right triggers. And in order to have a solid human-centered design process, we have to understand first, acknowledge and nurture the three dimensions of design at the same time. Design thinking, design doing, and design environment. Thank you very much.